talk about uh, the concept of co-creation design. <coughs> and this was something that I, a presentation that I gave in 2011 <coughs> with a paper that was given at a, a Scandinavian conference. <coughs> and I was uh, doing some research with virtual worlds and still am, but uh, this was on the concept of co-creation design. <coughs> so what I hope to um, talk about this, what is co-creation design and what is it meant um, to have a, an experience-based economy and um, <coughs> how it works within virtual worlds and some case examples as well. <coughs> so first of all, Co-creation design is a process where individual members of the community engage in and contribute to products and service creation, along with organizational members. <coughs> so the idea is that it's not just the company, the official company that produces a product and sells a product and creates value, but it's also the consumers of the product that can create value. And this is an example that uh, Facebook uses a co-creation design approach where members of the organization contribute to the value that's of the content that's created. <coughs> so this is a Norwegian tour association and people are contributing here to uh, information about places and tours uh, where they can go hiking and so forth. And um, this is a group page on Facebook and it's not Facebook which creates the content but it's the users themselves in the organization which create the content. <coughs> um, yeah. Um, <coughs> the next thing is uh, what is a virtual world because we're talking about co-creation in virtual worlds. And virtual worlds are uh, usually software running on a server that allows you to feel like you're in a three-dimensional space. And uh, examples of that would be Minecraft or Second Life. And they have some sort of, they support member representation through avatars. So you have uh, characters that represent you. And uh, they have persistent presence, meaning that if you change the world in some way, you can save that. And when you come back, it, it uh, shows that that change is still there. And uh, so you made some sort of difference or impact on that, on that space. And um, <coughs> it allows members or um, users in that, in that uh, program to interact with each other. And they can like, speak to each other. Sometimes they can work together on building things together. And they can exchange the things that they've built together. So it allows for different types of sharing of products, whether it's software or it's uh, a digital product, like creating some clothing in Second Life. If you create a pair of shoes, you can give it away or you can sell it. And there's different types of rules in each of the uh, in, in each of the program platforms uh, that allow you that work for the, that environment. So there's an economic system in Second Life where you can build things and you can sell the things that you build. And there's a different type of access system for sharing, um, for creating and, and sharing things in Minecraft, whereas it's not the same type of economic system. But anyway, there's usually some mechanisms in place for for creating together and for sharing. <coughs> uh, Co-creation design uh, emerged as a culture, and there's several factors that have led to the emergence of this culture. And that is, uh, one is the network individualism, where before the individuals had to, um, they would join clubs based on their geographic location. Uh, now they can join clubs and societies and groups that are anywhere. So they can um, belong to different um, 
organizations that are independent of physical boundaries and physical locations. And it gives people more choice and, and opportunities within societies because they can belong to different types of groupings of, of societies. So here we have uh, Flickr uh, where you share photos and it uh, shows um, photos of a group called Climb Norway and different people have contributed photos to this group and it doesn't matter if they're in different locations, they can still make contributions to this group. And here we have a picture of the Facebook page for the nursing students at uh, Molde College. And uh, some of the students are, of course, uh, at the college physically, but also some people are, are participating in the program from different places. And they even may be accessing you know, what's going on after they're already graduated and, and working. So it's a place where a certain group with a common interest can get together. So one of the factors was that we have this emerging network individualism. The second factor is that people are changing and that uh, research points out the younger generation of users of internet are more involved in content creation than those of the older generation. So this shows um, different types of users. There's the inactives, they are online, but they don't participate in, the f in any form of social media. There's uh, spectators, they read blogs and watch uh, videos and listen to podcasts. There's joiners, they use uh, social networking sites. There's collectors, they uh, collect say, like news from using RSS tags and web pages to gather news. And then there's critics that comment on blogs and make postings. And then there's creators that publish web pages and create blogs and upload videos and uh, other types of content. And it shows the different age groups and the people. This is seven, 12 to 17, 18 to 21, 22 to 26, 27 to 40, 41 to 50, 51 to 61, and 62 plus. And that the people that are in the more passive areas like inactive, and just spectators are, um, <clears throat> there's more in this uh, older range. And at the area where the most contributors are, the, the, those that are posting uh, content and posting videos and so forth, are more in this uh, younger range here. Although this, ex as people become different types of roles, if they become creators here, when they get older, then this, this should shift over as well, so that you, once you become active, you probably will continue to be active. <clears throat> the third factor is that the business environment is changing. And there's been a historical progression in our economy from an agricultural commodity industry to um, industrial uh, industry where we have an industrial business environment where we have goods production to a service economy where we have uh, um, the emergence of experience-based uh, products and services. So we see we have uh, commodities. Uh, these were closed environments where you have um, buyers and sellers and um, regulations controlling the environments and you have goods and these are also closed. And then you have the more open economies, the service economy, and then the experience-based economy. And in the experience-based economy, you have, um, <coughs> you have the ability, not, not just a set number of um, producers producing goods and products and services, but you have uh, individuals and users also contributing to the products and services. Um, there's a different definition of what is value in an experience-based economy. You have um, uh, value is derived from a product or service that is intangible and in the moment or experience-based. And value is realized in the consumption of the experience. So if we're not talking about uh, buying a book, uh, and we're, we might be talking about uh, watching a live performance, for example, that's an experience or being part of an educational uh, program. 
where you have interaction between the uh, teacher and the students. And an experience-based program, you get value by the consumption of the experience and not just by something that you have and you take away and you, you put it in a drawer. So there's different types of experience. You have, um, you have a, a scale of immersion. Uh, you have immersion, absorption, and you have passive participation and active participation. And they break the value into different types of categories like aesthetic value, escapist, educational, and entertainment. So you, you might have a product where you're looking at a, um, a video and um, you become very absorbed, but you're also very passive. Or you might have a, an online active uh, class going on, like in a, a 3D uh, classroom. And then in that case, you might be absorbed, but you might be very active, and that's also experience-based. So again, what is co-creation design? First, co-creation is the systematic way for organizations to identify users and involve them in the creation process. And then co-creation is used in the design process where individuals contribute their ideas to the creation process or to the innovation process. And that uh, they use their experiences and their needs to contribute to the creation process. And they can be used to help identify new trends as well. And then the output of the process is uh, better market insight, brand awareness, and idea generation. In the older business models, you have organizations that gain value by selling products. And that uh, you know that their product is successful by their, the sale of products. So the proof in the value of the product is in how many products you sell. But in the co-creation design process, the proof of the value of the product is at the point of creation. So it has to do with how many individuals are involved in the process of creation, or in the, involved in the design process at the beginning of the experience. So who's joining the website, or who's joining the online classroom, or who is joining in the creation of the experience? And so this determines the value of that type of product. And then um, the evidence of co-creation and design co culture in uh, society we have um, uh, the co-creation design process is interrelated to the experience-based economy. And if value is not generated on a continuous basis, the value disappears. So if you're not continuously creating new value from the experience, then uh, it has, doesn't have any value. People, if people stop coming to the site, uh, then the site loses its value. And then, um, or if they're, they're not involved in the active creation of the product, then it's no longer of value. So the organization is, um, the organization in such economy must be involved customers in the design and the needs to encourage the flow of experiences and create incentives for use and participation in the community and shared experiences. So it's about keeping the community alive and creating new experiences among the community. Uh, this is an example of a uh, movie that was created using crowdsourcing, which is a co-creative design process. And uh, it was, um, it has a plot of somebody being locked in a room and they need to uh, communicate with people about how to get out, how to get out of the room. And then the, there was real users and Facebook and Twitter and YouTube uh, that interacted with the film's website. So how the film was going to be recorded and go had to do with the interaction with the users. And um, they, were, um, they were filming it in segments and then they would be released every couple of days and then um, they would see how that would uh, be impacted by the social media and then they would release the next bit of it. Um, it says her only way out would be to bring you in. And this was a while ago. This was like 2011. 
And um, the people that were supporting this were Intel and Toshiba, and um, probably they had some association with the websites as well. Uh, and other examples of this could be, <coughs> I'm going to, um, they have a um, performance in uh, London about creating your own uh, documentary. And they want to get feedback from the audience about how a story is going to go. So you don't know the end of the story until you get feedback from the, from the audience. And it can go anyway. So it has to do with making uh, people part of the, the products, um, the end product, which is the, the creation experience. It's not just what you get at the end, but it's being part of the process of making it. That's, that's part of the value of the product. Um, so where can co-creation design take place? It's, of course, like companies like uh, Lego use uh, co-creation design to get, uh, they use user groups to contribute to uh, the creation of their um, um, robotics line of, of products. So people have contributed to how, how they should uh, um, develop their, their products. And you can also do this in virtual worlds because uh, it allows for a kind of face-to-face uh, -face, uh, format in real-time interaction. Instead of sending something in and waiting for an email reply, you can actually speak to somebody uh, without being physically present. And then <coughs> the individual can be represented through avatars, and it allows a flexible representation. So if you're talking about the creation of a persona, uh, you can represent yourself differently. And then you can share elements in the virtual world. So if I create, um, if I create an object in the virtual world, I can share it with somebody, but I can also create a document and share it with somebody. So it's just like a, a social uh, virtual meeting place. And some uh, experiments were done to make use of the concept of co-creation design. So you had um, uh, Philips in 2008. They created an island where people could uh, talk about different types of futures. And then they could talk about the, the concept of another one with ideation quest, where people could explore topics of sustainable living for the future. And then. Um, they would create different kinds of looks and habitats where you, they could talk about the concept, or maybe they could uh, build kind of models of energy efficient uh, areas. And then they could uh, look at different types of um, concepts for energy efficiency. And this was, an, uh, this was a <coughs> forum for allowing people to generate ideas and share in the creation of ideas. And then hopefully the company Philips would integrate these ideas into their products and services. So they were looking at it as a way of getting customer feedback. Another project that was um, done a while ago in <coughs> Nordic Virtual Worlds was a, uh, <coughs> an idea for uh, investigating entrepreneurship and innovation for uh, teaching uh, travel, uh, ideas for travel for change. So uh, talking about different types of social issues, health and social issues, environmental problems in different companies or different organizations. And um, so I think the purpose of this was to create sort of like travel sites in the virtual world where people could go to different sites and talk about different issues uh, within the virtual world. One of the things uh, we can think about is uh, how does a virtual world allow us to support co-creation design, and what are some of the things that are still needed to support it? So we have that <coughs> the advantages are that uh, 
communication takes place in real time so that you can have uh, groups of people talking together at the same time and interacting together. And then there's a flexibility in design so you can change the scenario, you can make it look different. And then uh, you can give, not only the scenery can be different, but the people can look different. So you can make up simulations of like a business room or you can make up simulations of a, um, like a theme park or a, a place you visit like Venice or something like that. You, it's very flexible into how the place looks. So it can be used for different simulations. And then collaboration, you can uh, share and create things. And uh, this is a way of um, being able to uh, create social value or you can use also the economics of the virtual world to be able to buy and sell things and have real, get real monetary value for what you buy and sell. With any co-creation design uh, process where you have companies that are working with individuals and in creating a product, there has to be um, some sort of agreement between the individual and the organization. And so the support for this uh, relationship between the individual and organization has to exist. So in terms of communication, there needs to be some sort of voice chat available for people to communicate. In terms of flexibility of design, we need to provide uh, guidelines and interactive um, assistance and allow people to be able to choose their level of anonymity so they can be anonymous. Um, and uh, the collaboration, they make use of workshops to unleash ideas and create uh, brainstorming. And then in terms of, uh, you need to be able to create incentive for the individuals to invest. Why should somebody participate in this process if they're not getting anything out of it? So we have the, you need to be able to create uh, exhibits where you can show off your work, maybe give the people that participate in the process, the creation process, extra rights, and create a rating system. So like, uh, I've contributed this much to this group, and this I get credit for this. And then flexibility, create objects based on the history of the real world place, uh, so it becomes more immersive and more believable. And then uh, make it known that the Linden Lab grants copyright to ownership to the creation of consumers. So uh, the incentive for individuals to build something is that they get copyright on what they build. And then the pro uh, provide support for members, uh, growth and skills acquisition. So this is uh, provide toolkits so that uh, the individuals can author things like Google Docs on a prim, so you can actually write a document and have it displayed in the virtual world. Provide instructional videos uh, or role play to instruct organizations. So you can have uh, videos about how to get started, how to get your uh, voice going, or what do you expect to do in this role play. Provide uh, stimulating and compelling experiences so you could uh, create a game in which everybody in the group participates and they can uh, have some sort of like a football game and then uh, they can um, create common ground in the social area and then also they could later on share um, their skills or their knowledge when they're talking in the meetings as well. So being able to provide a platform for that. So these are things that the environment needs to support and the needs for enabling co-creation to actually happen in the virtual space. So virtual worlds are just one place where co-creation design can exist, but like I said, you can do it on things like Facebook and just do it with idea creation in Facebook groups. And you can think about how this, instead of having virtual world affordances here, you could think about what are the uh, what are the advantages of Facebook for co-creation on the communication level, on the flexibility of design, and on being able to share. And then what are the challenges to support the individual to organization relationship for Facebook? 
how do they create uh, incentives for the individual to in invest? And how do you provide support for the members to grow and get new skills to become part of the network? So you can think about this in terms of any type of co-creation platform, and then think about what enables these things by filling in the blanks. And this is just a basic design science approach uh, where you look at the problem, you make suggestions, and it's a circular approach. So it's, it's part of the how you would approach uh, designing artifacts in, with a co-creation design approach using design science. And this was for the purpose of the, of the uh, presentation at the time. Um, I would say just being able to look at these factors and being able to apply it in another circumstance is, is part of the main point of, of this presentation. So future opportunities for co-creation design in virtual worlds. We have uh, some examples of co-creation design in Second Life. However, the platform may in time prove to be more supportive of of a co-creation design culture. It hasn't really gotten there yet. Um, <clears throat> we might have other kinds of platforms like OpenSim. And the reason is that uh, while you can control uh, your types of creations, you cannot really control everything in the Second Life system. You cannot control uh, the development of the server side. So this gives more opportunities for creation in open system, an open sim kind of environments than in, in Second Life. So you could say as a platform that open sim might be uh, more supportive of co-creation design. <coughs> summary is spelled wrong. Uh, in summary, we think the supportive environment for co-creation design should have the following features. Allow customers to experience and contribute to the design and sharing of products through rich media context. So the customers have to be able to experience the products and contribute to them. Uh, allow knowledge sharing and approaches that are successful in open source communities. And so you have to give uh, like kind of social rewards to allow people to be able to see that you're crea creating something and that you're giving something that to the community. And then platforms should support trust building and relationships between individuals and organizations contributing to innovative design, uh, addressing privacy and security. So this goes back to the issues that we're here about, uh, ethical issues of privacy and security. So with any kind of um, platform, people have to be able to trust uh, their the information, their personal information. OK, so that's that. Um, so it's just a different way of thinking about product creation through the co-creation design process. And I think you see examples of this in your everyday life. So it's something that we can think about in terms of future e-business. It's not just going to be the seller and the buyer, but it's a, the buyers are also involved in the production of the, of the product as well. Okay. So um, I went through this um, kind of quickly. And I think I, <coughs> I think I don't want to go through this uh, extra notes on ethical issues. You can look at it, and it does uh, talk about the same issues that are in chapter three of the book. It just goes into uh, more details and some examples of this, so you can read through this um, yourself as well. I don't think there's anything that's contradictory to it. Uh, so I think we'll just stop here for today and my voice is going and um, <coughs> well we don't have any meetings for the next three times please remember you don't have to come check the schedule that is online so no three meetings here and then the next time we meet will be February 11th which I believe is Tuesday not next Tuesday not this coming Tuesday but the Tuesday, but the Tuesday after Okay, and um, I will 
basically just check off your assignments as you hand them in. And um, some of them, probably not this one because we already talked about it in lecture, but some of them we will talk about in class after you hand them in. But this one in particular, we already spent a lot of time on it, so I won't be talking about it again. Okay. Okay, thank you.